of the ambassador. Uh, thank you for this invitation to speak on behalf of all the authors of the sixth assessment cycle of the IPCC. Across six reports and now the synthesis report, the IPCC has found a world facing increasing risks from climate change with impacts in all regions of the world and with losses and damages happening now, especially in developing countries. We are fast approaching critical thresholds in the climate system from which it will be very difficult to return. We have also assessed that there is still time. Urgent climate action can secure a livable future for all. Climate justice and rights-based approaches, <clears throat> excuse me, are increasingly recognized as central to climate action. IPCC reports span thousands of pages, which are distilled into a very small number of words. While you may only see climate justice and rights-based approaches mentioned a few times in the final summary for policymakers, the supporting evidence for each word in that summary relies on pages of assessments with citations that can range into the hundreds or even thousands. It is in this way that the IPCC has assessed the critical role of climate justice and rights-based approaches in climate action. Climate change affects people inequitably and everyone does not contribute equally to climate change. Policy decisions related to climate change adaptation and mitigation that ignore or worsen risks of adverse effects for different groups and ecosystems will increase vulnerability. This will negatively affect capacity to deal with climate impacts and impede sustainable development. Concepts of justice, consent, and rights-based decision-making, together with considerations and measures of overall well-being, are increasingly being used to build consensus and to add legitimacy to adaptation actions, not just for communities now, but across generations. Applying these principles, for example, as part of monitoring and evaluation of outcomes particularly during the large changes that the IPCC report calls for, can provide a basis for ensuring that the distribution of benefits and costs are clearly identified. Adaptation outcomes for the most vulnerable are enhanced through approaches that focus on equity, inclusivity, and rights-based approaches. Here in particular, we highlight the importance of the inclusion of Indigenous knowledge and local knowledge that can help us to avoid the trade-offs and risks for the most vulnerable. All adaptation actions are enhanced by addressing poverty, inequities, enhancing education and climate literacy, through women and girls empowerment, and through peace building. Rights-based approaches can also be about building the resilience of most of the most vulnerable groups. For example, all Indigenous peoples are often identified as being vulnerable to climate change, but this framing does not reflect the diverse responses and adaptations of Indigenous peoples to these ongoing challenges. Rights-based approaches are also about harnessing the strength and the resilience of Indigenous peoples and other vulnerable and marginalized groups globally as they adapt to these complex changes. It is clear from our work that to secure a sustainable future is to have one that is pursued in an inclusive and integrated manner that enhances human and ecological well being with equitable and just ways for reconciling divergent interests, values, and worldviews. The IPCC has assessed that equity, social justice, and climate justice are at the center of the transformations that are needed. It is to ensure that all voices are heard and that we truly identify actions which secure a livable future for all. Thank you. Thank you very much for your, for your <clears throat> contribution in presenting us uh, the work that uh, is reflected in the report, the work of your own uh, working group. Just a small technical precision that I've been asked to, uh, to, uh, to say, as I saw some people were taking pictures, 
it is just only the, uh, the, the people from our, our team at the very first row who is able to take pictures uh, and, and we thank you to respect this, um, uh, this indication. Now, um, as we just heard, and what is really interesting is to see how much uh, the, new, the work that has been done by the IPCC in a way converge to some of the discussion we have been ha having here in, in these walls on the question of equity and social justice and a human rights-based approach. So now let me turn to uh, Mrs. Lily Four, who is the Deputy Director of the Climate, and Climate Change and Energy Program at the Center for International Environmental Law. Um, Lily, you were in Interlaken, you follow these negotiations, so uh, please, we're very happy to hear, uh, to hear you on this element. Thank you so much, and hello, everyone. So, um, while this report, this synthesis report, is really a summary, what is new about it is that it connects the dots across the different working groups of the IPCC and across the six major reports that the IPCC released since 2014, which include three special reports, one on 1.5 degrees of global warming, one on land, and one on oceans, um, just to uh, remind us here. And each um, of these reports, you know, contain a long scientific report and a summary for policy makers that governments approve the text of line by line, just uh, to recall that. So it connects the dot at a time when the world has moved on since 2014 for sure, especially because the impacts of climate change are hitting harder. We've heard about it. We've got a war in Europe with escalating prices linked to fossil fuels, energy, fertilizers, food. They're driving up emissions and they're also making the world a more unequal place and are contributing to geopolitical tensions rising. So this synthesis report is not the first and won't be the last wake up call, but it's a unique moment really. Uh, and the importance of a report like this has probably never been greater. It's also specifically reporting, important because governments have to update their national climate plans for the Paris Agreement. This IPCC report must inform them how much more ambition is needed, what are the most effective solutions to limit, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees, as they have agreed in Paris in 2015. So the main points, and this is really building on my previous speakers, is that this synthesis confirms what we know, that deep, immediate, and sustained emission reductions through an immediate, rapid, and equitable fossil fuel up phase out is really the surest path to limiting global warming to 1.5 degree. And it also confirms an adaptation and mitigation actions that priority, prioritize equity, social justice, climate justice, and rights-based approaches lead to better outcomes. So they must be prioritized by policymakers if they follow the guidance of this report. But to talk a little bit about what happened last week, the negotiations this past week also highlighted um, a little bit of a clash between the indisputable climate science, the physical science of climate change, and the mainstream economic models that in underpin the mitigation pathways that perpetuate a business as usual approach and serve the interests of fossil fuel producers. So a number of delegations had legitimate concerns that the fact that mitigation pathways are built around models that have certain assumptions and key limitations was not transparently communicated to policymakers. So I can share now that um, it is quite helpful that we now in the summary for policymakers have a text box that summarizes those concerns to policymakers so they can weigh the scenarios presented to them with caution. They can differentiate between the scenarios and choose the ones that highlight policies that actually align with the physical science and don't confuse the models with the real world, which is what sometimes happens. So this is extremely relevant because building our mitigation strategies and models that lock in inequitable growth way into the future and that conveniently assume away the manifold risks of certain technologies assumed in the models delays climate action and increases the likelihood of overshooting our temperature target. I want to speak to that a little bit more specifically. So two of the technologies that or types of technologies that are really important to mention here. One is carbon capture and storage, CCS, the idea that we can, you know, capture carbon emitted by polluting industries and then sequester it in geological formations. It is a highly contested technology. It's been around for decades mostly to produce more oil. Um, it's called enhanced oil recovery. It is not really delivered in practice. 
This synthesis report of the IPCC highlights that the impl implementation of CCS faces technological, economic, institutional, ecological, um, environmental and social cultural barriers and that currently global rates of CCS deployment are far below those in modeled pathways. It also highlights and gives concrete figures to that, that CCS remains the highest cost approach with the least potential, especially in the near term, the period when rapid emission cuts are most important. And those findings are really, you know, confirmed by real the world evidence because most CCS projects um, um, have decades long histories of over promising and under delivering. And usually, you know, the, the high capture rates that the industry claims um, they're aiming for are not met in practice. Currently, the capture rates of all of the installed CCS capacity captures 0.1% of global emissions. And this is coming from, you know, a technology that, that has been around for decades and that has, you know, we've sunk millions and more into that technology. So the IPCC gives that helpful information that we cannot rely on that te technology and we cannot use it as an excuse not to phase out fossil fuels. The other part is around something that's called carbon dioxide removal or CDR. In the IPCC uh, terminology of CDR, it includes both um, biological sequestration of carbon in, in, um, in ecosystems, for example, through ecosystem restoration, but it also includes uh, geoengineering approaches, such as bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, or direct air capture, chemically filtering carbon from the air and then storing it through CCS. Um, what is important to note is that most of the IPCC scenarios, so yeah. the scenarios the IPCC a lot relies upon for its mitigation pathways, project large-scale carbon dioxide removal. It doesn't say whether it's biological or technological, so the whole sweep, to bring temperatures back below a certain threshold in the second half of the century. That is not a representation of what is possible in the real world, and it's just what the models assume. But what became clear this week is that as the fossil and what is becoming clear outside of, you know, IPCC negotiations really, is that the fossil economy, economy is threatened by the economic viability and the competitiveness of renewable energies at scale. So big polluters, fossil fuel companies are really using the idea of carbon dioxide removal as a cover while they plan to expand their business. And this is not aligned with IPCC findings and messages coming from the IPCC reports and this synthesis because the IPCC communicates the huge physical uncertainties of doing large-scale carbon removal. It highlights the risks of mitigation deterrence when, assum when assuming CDR sometime in the future actually delays near-term climate action. And several of the um, IPCC uh, reports um, of the last couple of years and this synthesis report highlight specific risks and harms, including human rights harms associated with these CDR technologies. So especially the IPCC reports clearly warn about the impacts that CDR technology have on the ecosystems and communities where they are deployed. As they are resource intensive, they use massive amounts of water, land and energy, so basically leading to resource scarcity, forced displacement, and environmental pollution. The most, ambition mitigation, the most ambitious mitigation pathways put out by the IPCC, the only ones that reach, you know, that manage to limit warming to 1.5, they really set the floor, not the ceiling for necessary climate action. So solving the climate crisis is not about what works on paper, it's what delivers in practice. So states have the obligation to respect, protect, and promote human rights, and relying on technologies that undermine, undermine those very rights due to their impacts on ecosystems and, and communities, and thereby further delaying real action to address climate change in the near future would result in clear violations of those obligations. So the Human Rights Council must be aware of that and continue to emphasize the importance of human rights-based climate action. And all of that is a message that is very much supported and coming, coming clearly through in this new IPCC report. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lily. Um, from what you just have presented, uh, and that's something that directly uh, uh, concerns the work here in the Human Rights Council is uh, precisely looking on practice and what delivers and what does practice deliver, which is one of the work which precisely human rights bodies are supposed to do. What is the reality, some kind of a very important reality to check, 
And if we, we follow and understand well the, the new report, um, equity is actually not just a question of justice, but also a question of efficiency in the measures. I mean, it delivers better. So with that in mind, I suppose that's interesting to hear for the Office of the High Commissioner. So I'm very happy to turn to uh, Ben Shashter, who is Human Rights Officer and the Head of the Environment and Climate Change Unit within the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights. Ben, how do you feel uh, hearing these outcomes of the new synthesis report of the IPCC? Thank you, Eve, and uh, to my fellow panelists. Um, I think they've presented the science, they've presented the findings. Um, so I'm maybe not going to dwell too much on those elements, as, as important as they are. Um, I, I want to reflect a little bit on the process um, and, and the way forward and how we communicate about climate change. Um, because I think, you know, one of the things that's really critical and, and really simple um, is that we need to figure out a way to communicate clearly about how bad the situation is and about what the solutions are. And we know both of those things. Um, but we definitely struggle to communicate it in an effective way. And even the summary for policymakers has some challenges in that perspective. You know, when I, when I think about communicating, my, my son, who's four years old, was very curious about why I was away for a week um, at this discussion. Um, I certainly can't read to him <laughs> from the summary for policymakers. Um, but what I can say is that fossil fuel consumption is killing people. And it's doing it right now. And the Human Rights Council has mandated a number of reports about the human rights impacts of climate change starting in 2008. And we actually knew that fossil fuel consumption was going to kill people and is killing people far before then. And I think we need to start talking in much starker language. Because the other thing we know, and we have known for a long time, is what some of the solutions are. And so we talk about those as pathways for sustainable development. Really, we're talking about solar power and wind energy and hydro and things that we've had for decades, but we haven't scaled. So policymakers and businesses and lots of people with lots of power to make decisions for decades have consciously ignored a catastrophic threat to people and to human rights until we're at the point that we're at right now, which according to the IPCC is already irreversible damage, but irreversible damage that will get so much worse if we don't take urgent action by doing the things we know how to do, which is stop using fossil fuels, start using renewables, use a rights-based approach, use and consider equity and climate justice in action, and communicate more effectively about why we're doing this, why we need to do it. So thinking again about my four-year-old son, by the time he's an adult, if we don't get on track, coral reefs will be gone. That's the reality. The findings of this report are that the situation, the risks are higher, they're going to come sooner, and we have very limited time to take action. And we need to communicate more effectively about this. We have some degree of warming that is locked in because of the emissions already in the atmosphere. We have maybe in the future some possibility that we can remove carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions from the atmosphere in order to try to restore equilibrium. But the damage to certain ecosystems cannot be repaired. And I think that's really important because so much of the discussion that's being perpetuated by those whose interests are consistent with continuation of the fossil fuel economy 
relates to we're working on the technologies to fix this later. And the reality is we cannot fix everything later. We cannot fix for the tens of millions of people who have already been displaced by climate change, their lives, their children's lives, the future generations. We cannot fix it. So we need to do more now immediately to make sure the problem doesn't get worse. And it will get so much worse unless we act. Now that wasn't a very positive take <laughs> on this situation. I think it was a realistic take. The other thing, and the positive element, which I've also touched upon, is that there is a way forward that this report maps. And it's rights-based approaches, it's phasing out fossil fuels, it's doing the things that we know how to do, that we actually have the capacity to do. Um, the Secretary General has called for a global solidarity pact to address climate change, uh, particularly involving the G20, who are responsible for the vast majority of current um, and historical emissions. We need a global solidarity pact to address climate change because to transition away, as, as Eve and others have mentioned, we need equity, we need rights-based approaches, we need to respect the rights of indigenous peoples, we need gender equality, and that's what the science tells us, but it should also be what we feel. <laughs> it should be the way that we know we need to move forward. Otherwise, we're in real trouble. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close uh, by, by sharing with you the High Commissioner's um, tweet, an effort to communicate more effectively on this. We all need to be doing it. This is the most urgent crisis of our generation. If we don't fix it, we can't come back and fix it later. So today's IPCC report is our last wake-up call before the curtain drops on irreversible climate disaster. Its survival guide is clear. We must radically cut emissions by 2030 and protect, resource, and heed the calls of those most impacted by climate change. It's now or never. Those are the words of the High Commissioner. They're being echoed by the UN system across the board. Um, we know what we need to do, but we're not doing it. And the what definition of that, I believe, is insanity. Can I hear? Um, Can I hear? Uh, yeah. The COP He's offers a critical opportunity, He's, as, uh, as uh, other speakers have raised, so to he, take he the necessary speak, steps mm -hmm. to step up ambition, to follow the science, as all states have committed to doing under the Paris Agreement and the UNFCCC, to increase the ambition of nationally determined contributions, and to put in motion the solidarity that we need to address this crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, for, uh, for your contribution and, and also for sharing the, uh, the position of the, uh, the Secretary General and the High, uh, the high Commissioner. Um, well, we, we've heard, Ben, that you didn't go to Interlaken with your son, and we're happy that you did respect his fundamental children's rights. Uh, but if at four, uh, four years old you don't go to Interlaken, uh, it doesn't mean that the younger generation were not present in, uh, in Interlaken. And I'm very happy to now turn to uh, Jonas Campus from the climate strike in Switzerland. You uh, attended Interlaken. Please share with us uh, your, your thoughts. Yes, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so it was the first time that actually you've participated at the IPCC. Um, it has never happened before, um, which I think is something that um, we can criticize very much because this whole report is about us. It, it's, it's our future. And I think like, especially this one figure in um, like the first figure in the summary for policymaker outlines this in a very strong, but also um, in a strong language, but also it's 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 shown as a, as an image that really shows on what are the possible pathways for a child that is born right now, but also f for us all in this room, we are the generation, we are um, 
the ones that um, need to act, but also on the other hand are impacted on what the report um, says and what the future tra trajectories are. So yeah, um, this report is super impactful um, for us when the special report on 1.5 came out um, four years ago. Um, it was one of those sparks that really led to this huge global youth climate strike movement that we as climate strike Switzerland are part of. We're the branch, um, like the Swiss branch of the um, global Fridays for Future movement. And as that, we were invited um, in Interlochen as like the first youth uh, being present at the space. And um, yeah, on the one hand, we were well received, but on the other hand, it was also shocking how underrepresented um, like in the offer teams, women were, but also at um, in, in terms of the delegations, um, people of color and um, people from the global south and also indigenous people were um, very much underrepresented. And I think this also, uh, always needs to be um, taken into consideration when we also read this report. I think in general, the report is very strong. It's sometimes you need to read between the lines to get it, but it's very, very clear in what we need to do. And I think my previous speakers have already um, like mentioned a lot of things, um, but it's, it's, it's very clear. It says we need, or like, not we need, but there will, it's absolutely necessary that we, there is disruptive change. It's mentioned twice in the, in the summary for policymakers, and um, not just in terms of um, technological change, but, but also in economic, like the economic system needs a disruptive change. And I think it's very clear. It also um, is very um, clearly outlined in the figures. Um, that emissions need to um, re be reduced drastically right now in this decade, and um, actually like today and not tomorrow. Um, this is very, very clear, I think, what, what comes out of the report. And it also, it's also very clear on who takes up most of the responsibility, who has taken up, uh, who has also uh, used most of those uh, carbon emissions in the past. And um, therefore, I think what the Secretary General said um, was very clear on that, that the G20 they need to um, reach net zero by 2040 um, or near that. As Climate Strike Switzerland, that's also our, our sister branch in, um, in Germany, we have demanded like net zero um, by 2030 for Switzerland or net zero by 2035 in Germany, um, which is very important when you look at the carbon budget. Um, if you, this is really um, like a very, very strong um, this is a very strong border that we can't cross at any point if you want to keep it to 1.5, which is absolutely crucial um, on the one hand for those in the global south, but also for us as future generations if you look at what would be um, the outcomes of um, a three degree um, hotter world um, to us and, 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 and also like the, the generations that, that come after us. Yeah, for us in general, it was very important at the report first to just um, keep the strong language. Um, I think also during this week at some points or in some points of the, um, parts of the report, um, it was really able, thanks to um, strong negotiations by particular countries, um, to bring in even stronger languages that really helps us also to take up these sentences to, um, like, ha to hold our governments responsible by those sentences and to see what they deliver. Because it's, yeah, as you already mentioned, this report is the last one um, that we will get in this decade, and it's really showing um, us on what we need to do. Um, yeah, and for us in general, it was um, then really important that, um, first of all, this language stays in there, but on the other hand, it's very clear also um, who is impacted and what the impact for youth is in terms of, um, for example, mental health, um, but also in other, um, other areas, which is also partially mentioned in the summary for policymakers, but I would really recommend to you, um, please also read the longer report, read the summary for policymakers of the um, different working groups, because there it's even more sophisticated on, on what needs to be done um, in general. Yeah, and so for us as, as young people, um, after this um, special report on 1.5 and then um, the other special reports and the one at uh, the free um, reports by the free working groups, um, this is really, again, um, the last call for action. Well, it's not the last call, but it's the, it's the call for action that we, we, we are going to take up. It's going to um, empower us um, on the one hand. We'll take this to the street. Um, I think, as Ben already mentioned, it's not just um, this report is not just for governments, it's not just to be there to have rather um, also sometimes a bureaucratic language, but it's really 
um, the support is, is for us, the people, and, and we are deliver delivering it to the, um, on the streets. Um, four years ago, when the special report came out, we, uh, we took it and uh, we hammered it, as uh, Martin Luther has done 500 years ago, on the wall of the Credit Suisse, you may have heard um, the, the name of that bank, um, because it's one of the largest uh, fossil fuel um, investors. So, and we were going to do this again, maybe not this action, but we're going to deliver it to the streets. We, and this report is not just uh, there um, to be um, in the rooms of governments, um, but I think clearly outlines what needs to be done. And um, yeah, this has been mentioned several times. It's, um, we definitely need to reduce fossil fuels. We need um, to keep our forests and um, empower young people empower indigenous people and our, in, empower the people of the global south and that's really the way forward and how we can solve it. And, and this is not just what I say, but it's really written in the IPCC report over and over again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jonas, and for re reminding us uh, the role, the very critical role that um, youth movement have played over the recent years. Uh, on, on this issue, uh, and indeed it is a very strong urgency, and, and I think you're doing a great job in, in highlighting how much this is an urgent matter, and, and I think it's our responsibility for all of us, especially here uh, within the uh, human rights bodies, to make sure that you have a safe place and a safe space in order to do this, and that you can be heard and that you can develop this dialogue, which is so much uh, needed. And indeed, action is still possible. That's one of the very good aspects coming out of this report. But it's urgent to make it happen. And, and equity and justice are very important elements for the efficiency of these uh, climate measures. So now, we, before we have a, a final round of positions from the panel, we we'll have the possibility to take two or three questions. If ever you have uh, any questions, I see, uh, yes, from Brazil, please. And if you can uh, keep it short so we can have a few questions, but also if you are addressing specific, uh, specific uh, answer from someone of the panel, please uh, do so. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. And I would like to thank all of the organizers of uh, this event. Um, I was at the IPCC in Interlaken and had the pleasure of meeting Elizabeth and meeting many of you who were there. And it really scares me when I look around the room and I feel that I am one of the youngest people. So I'm very happy that uh, um, now we do have the representation of youth and we do have this more inclusive approach when it comes to gender, when it comes to generation, when it comes to ethnicities. And my question is more of a provocation and to see how you feel about this, but my impression is that everybody is ready for the others to act. When they say, oh, we need to take action, but are you ready to give up your car so that the Marshall Islands is not flooded? Are you ready to maybe not turn up your heat so much so that we can build a hospital in the Amazon? I don't know. Uh, my impression is a little bit negative too, that when we call for action, we want others to do things, but we're not willing to take responsibility for what we have done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other question or provocation? Please, uh, Gambia, if, I'm, if I read the sign correctly. Yes. Thank you, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I'll continue from where Brazil uh, stops. Um, uh, thank you very much for the meeting, uh, the organizers. I will also ask, are you ready um, to, give up mo to give more to countries or groups that are not even contributing to climate crisis, but yet still they are bearing the brunt of the, uh, the crisis? Thank you. Thank you very much. And I see a final question from the Philippines, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I don't really have a question, but more of a comment and, and an observation. Uh, I would like to express our deepest appreciation to CL for organizing this, and of course, to our esteemed panelists and to Her Excellency for articulating very, very eloquently the sentiments of developing countries and 
climate vulnerable countries like the Philippines. Uh, you cannot imagine how important this report is to us, especially uh, the part where you reaffirm the importance of prioritizing equity, social justice, and climate justice in our adaptation and mitigation actions for the simple reason that not only it, it is just, it also works. It, it is one that delivers, as our moderator has said. You see, we've had very difficult discussions in this session of the Council on two resolutions that touch on climate change. There seems to be an effort, concerted or not, to make CBDR a mere reaffirmation of the UNFCCC and its Paris Agreement and CBDR, the Voldemort of all international agreements that we have agreed to. It seems like there are some delegations who would rather not have CBDR mentioned or affirmed in these resolutions that have something to do with climate change. And for us, this is very, very alarming, and it, uh, it does not augur well for the future. And so my question, well, maybe I have a question after all. What can our partners in this room do to, you know, avert this uh, uh, trend, if I may call this a trend, because it seems like as crunch time comes, there will be greater pushback and a walk back on these internationally agreed principles and obligations enshrined in the UNFCCC and Paris Agreements and reaffirmed COP and COP again, and I would suppose in the upcoming COP uh, in, in UAE. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments and, and, and questions. I'm in the easy position not to be the one to have to answer to it, <laughs> but to turn to the panelists uh, for a very short uh, element of, uh, of answer, because we have to give the, the, the room in, in a few minutes. But first, in a, very briefly, Ambassador, if you want the first reaction. No, I just wanted to um, thank the organizers. I didn't have a chance to do so when I spoke in the beginning. But thank you for um, allowing us to be here to continue to share our story. And, and um, going back to uh, Ben's uh, reference to his uh, four-year-old child and our, our youth champion here, um, the report is, of course, um, theirs and their future. However, I, I should also remind us all that there are countries <laughs> like ours that may disappear. So this is an emergency. We are in a state of global emergency. Thank you. We must act now. Thank you, Thank you Ambassador. And um, I'll turn now to Dr. Gilmore. Thank you. Uh, you know, as Ben said, um, Scientists have kids too. My four-year-old didn't come with me either. Um, as much as I'd like to imagine a world where our kids are playing under the tables uh, as we're negotiating these drafts um, and these um, SPMs to really remind us of why we are all there. Um, and I just wanted to note, I feel so lucky to be back at home with her now. Um, I'd like to thank all of you who are still not yet back at home. Uh, and um, I'd like to also thank those who joined the IPCC plenaries as observers. Uh, it really highlights a key IPCC finding, uh, the importance of having them there, of civil society, youth, women, Indigenous peoples as integral to helping us find the solution. People often say the science is clear. and it is. We know what to do, and we do know that this engages with a rap rapid phase out of fossil fuel production and consumption. This can also chart a new path for the IPCC to shift from describing the impacts and risks in the scientific literature to shifting to really informing the actions on losses and damages, equity with pathways that go beyond the limitations of the models and to better engage with all of our imaginations on what a sustainable future for all really will look like. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me turn to Lily. Yeah, I'll react to the provocation um, from the colleague from, from Brazil briefly, just saying, I think what we've seen with, you know, some of the major crises, at least from, you know, where I live in, in Europe, COVID and then the war in Ukraine, I think, 
what we've seen is really that public was ra ready for massive changes and transformation. They called for action, and we saw huge, a huge amount of international solidarity. But what we also saw, saw that we were lull lulled into inaction by very strong forces that have vested interest in a business as usual. You know, this is why we now talk about an energy crisis in Europe and not a fossil fuel crisis. Well, that is actually what it is. Um, so I think in addition to Ben's call to, you know, more clearly communicate the messages, I think we also need to find ways to stop the spread of disinformation and false solutions. Thank you very much. Ben, the final word. Thank you. Um, so I have an electric bicycle with a couple of kids seats, not a car, and we all make choices. Some of us are privileged actually to be able to make choices, and, and some of us don't necessarily have the means uh, to make a lot of choices. But certainly we all make choices about our lifestyles and our own consumption. One of the things that it's been shown the fossil fuel industry has done, and they've, they've done with a great d degree of intentionality, is they've tried to push a narrative that they're just providing a service that people want, and people are the ones driving this crisis. And that is not accurate. That's not consistent with an understanding of behavioral science or of power dynamics. They are pushing a service that they are selling through misinformation, that they are selling through encouraging consumption, and they're doing it in very clever ways to try to pass the buck from them to regular people. The reality is we all will have to play a role in addressing this crisis, but there are some who are much more responsible for it than others. And that's why uh, the UNFCCC and many other um, processes have included the principle of common but differentiated responsibility and respective capacities amongst their guiding principles. That's why equity and climate justice is such an important part of the IPCC findings. Um, because what that's telling us is that there is a way to get out of this problem. And sure, each of us have individual decisions and choices that we can make that can contribute to it. But it really starts with a redistribution of power and resources away from the fossil fuel economy towards renewables and away from a select few extremely wealthy companies and people and governments Thank you, towards everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let me turn now to who has, to, to, for the final word, to who it belongs, to the younger generation. Jonas, for the very final word before we give uh, the room back. Yeah, I'm going to really short. Um, so, yeah, I'm f like from a, probably the most richest country from the wor uh, in the world, and um, this country is, is, has a huge, huge responsibility uh, when it comes to climate change, but also the inaction. Um, the Swiss government has just over the weekend promised 209 billion francs to, to, to a bank or to two banks, which are also, like they, they are responsible for more than 20 times the emissions that just like the people in Switzerland are causing. And um, I think with this money, we could, we could have, like the fair share of Switzerland would be 1 billion every year to those 100 um, billion um, for the Green Climate Fund. I mean, with that, we could have uh, funded it for over 200 years. And um, I think what I'm taking away from this, from this IPC report, but also um, now from uh, what has been mentioned in this room, that is, we're going to continue fighting for that. We're going to take um, those, um, or we're going to hold our government our, and those companies and, and also the, all the other fossil fuel firms in Switzerland responsible. Thank you very much for this uh, takeaway, uh, which is very, very relevant. I want to thank everybody in the room for attending uh, to this meeting. I want to thank also all of the more than 100 people who also follow this event uh, online. And we also welcome all of those who will see it on a replay. Um, we will have also in May the Geneva Dialogue on Human Rights and Climate Change. You will be shortly invited for these events. Uh, it will be meeting on the 17th of May in the afternoon. So we look forward to having all of you at this event. Thank you very much. And once again, a very big thanks to our panelists.